Uh, yeah, okay. So let's go on. Um, so this chapter today is um, LSTM, which is basically um, long short term memory networks. Um, so LSTM is basically um, uh, a derivative or variant of what is called RNN recurrent neural networks. Um, so they are developed just to solve the issue, some of the issue with feed forward that we saw last week. And the RNN solved those issues. Um, but I, um, the books actually started talking about LSTM, but it's supposed, I'm not sure that um, it's supposed to talk about RNN first, then it talks about LSTM because LSTM is somehow a subset of, uh, it's variant of, um, RNN, but it talks about LSTM first, then it talks about RNN. So let's go on. So um, uh, what I want to talk about first is just um, some of the issues of feed forward that we saw last week. And um, so basically, this is um, simple feed forward that we saw last week, um, Justin presented. Um, it just we start put layers, layers on top of that as feed forward. Um, but Actually, this feed forward has some issues. Number one is that um, uh, they basically assume simultaneous access because we are just putting them in uh, simultaneously and using uh, fixed window size. So uh, we all know these um, uh, feed forward, they are in some ways language models. They're trying to predict something. Uh, so they are basically constrained to what we call window size. So for example, uh, a simple feed forward will have a window size of three, then it will be able to predict the next word within its window size. But it cannot be able to predict a word or something within this side, right? Uh, so these are some of the issues we have with simple feed forward. Um, but using embedding solved the problem of uh, simple n-gram we already saw. So we see that simple, um, simple feed, forward, uh, feed forward is using embedding and it's no longer using n-gram and it solved those issues. But still there are some issues. Number one, context. So given anything that is outside these windows, then it cannot predict what is net. So uh, anything that is within, not within it is concept is a problem. So that is why they say anything outside the context windows has no impact on the decision being made. Secondly, um, the use of window makes it difficult for network to learn systematic pattern arising from phenomena like compositionality, the way mean of word in place is combined together. So uh, we can see two issues. Uh, it cannot handle like praises in natural way we do in English. We put praise together and stuff like that. So this kind of issue actually prevent um, uh, the simple feed forward to perform better. And now the in deep learning, two ways to actually solve these issues are um, uh, proposed. The first one is uh, what is called recurrent neural networks and also transformer. So these two architecture in deep learning are what solve the issues of um, context and also such kind of uh, uh, understanding praise level. Um, yeah, so uh, this is basically um, a simple uh, RNN. Uh, RNN is just a network that contacts cyclic within its network. So when we have this, it has a cyclic, it understand what is uh, at the big, at the previous and what is the at the next. Um, yeah, so uh, RNN serves as the basis for many other uh, uh, language models uh, like uh, LSTM, like um, GRU and other stuff. So that's uh, one of the issues of uh, simple feed forward, um, but it's not discussed in the book. I just am trying to see, uh, bring the context why we need um, LSTM before. So the book basically start talking about LSTM, LSTM but it does not discuss uh, in details um, why we need uh, more beta architecture. So um, also the book only discuss um, recurrent neural networks. Uh, it does not discuss what is called transformer. So transformer in NLP are now the, uh, the, the, the topic of the day. Everything in NLP now uh, more or less is based on transformer uh, because they solve some of the issue as well with recurrent neural network. Um, yeah, do you wanna talk, uh, Layla? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, okay. You wanna talk, Layla? Everyone um, wants to talk. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say, um, can you repeat what you said about the issues with RNN? Uh, RNN or uh, uh, feed forward or RNN? RNN. Ah, okay. 
So for RNN, um, is the, uh, um, later uh, there is some issue that we discuss about RNN because we have not yet just uh, look at it in details. Uh, I, I think I have the issues uh, there, so we can discuss them. If we, um, just what I want to say is that um, RNN is just um, any network with uh, cyclic within its network and it serves as the uh, basis for complex uh, approaches like LSTM, GRU get a recurrent neural network and other stuff. So RNN is the basis and it has its own shortcoming. Uh, some of the shortcoming is that it, what we call vanishing gradient, right? Uh, because it does not uh, um, learn things that are far from the uh, uh, network. Well, we'll see them um, in a bit. Um, so, yeah, so. If, if I can just ask a question. Um, yeah. So the, the diagram, the image you showed earlier, it looked like something, it looks like something fun. Yes, that one, like fundamentally different is happening. So for example, with the, what we looked at last week, which was a classification problem, mm -hmm. we were predicting uh, something like a class label uh, mm -hmm. for each observation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, it looks like we're predicting what the next word will be. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So that's just a exactly. very different application. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. So here, I, so RNN or simple feed forward can be used in different kind of application, right? Um, one of these application that I just take here is the application in uh, sequence modeling, predicting the next word. So you can have different kind of application. This is not the um, last week application. So for example, even LSTM, you can have different application uh, using sequence modeling, using different kind of uh, stuff. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, predicting of the next word. And um, that is why I just, yeah, you are right. And so, so the problems with uh, the feed forward network, are those problems unique to the sequence modeling application? Well, so for example, um, like the sliding window, for example, there was no sliding window that we talked about last. Yeah, and that just wasn't part yeah. of it. Yeah. So if you look at all these, um, the uh, neural network, they are just doing prediction, right? That is, I think, the, what they are doing. That is a basis of them, right? So um, if, um, okay, can you repeat the question, please? So, um, so for example, like a lot of the problems that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, that are that kind of the bullet points or, or they would be bullet points if the visual yeah. mode had been enabled. Um, yeah. Oh, let me see if it, the visual mode can work now. Oh, no. <laughs> um, th they seem like problems unique to the application of, uh, sequence modeling for example do we have limited context is the first mm -hmm. one that's mm -hmm. mentioned yeah yeah yes anything limited outside class. the context window blah blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and i mean so for example there wasn't really a such i mean there's at least nothing that has the name of a context window that we talked about so far mm -hmm. or that and it, yeah and the second problem is also to deal dealing with windows mm -hmm. so I guess that's my my question is just that I don't know to me it seems like these problems I mean and it's not bad but my question slash comment is just that it seems like these problems aren't global are there problems with feed forward networks regardless of application the problems uh -huh. with feed forward networks when the application is sequence modeling oh yeah so I think um uh, I may not have the <laughs> perfect answer but um I think uh uh, feed forward, uh, maybe what I'm saying may be context dependent, um, application dependent. They are uh, for text or something like that, or for prediction. But um, I'm not quite sure actually. Um, yeah. Okay. But um, if we look at the feed forward, basically what the tax they are doing, even is if for not for the uh, prediction of the word. They are basically doing prediction in any sense, right? They are language models. Are they not language models? Feedboard. They are language model, right? They are basically predicting um, words, um, 
next to it. I'm not sure anyway. Yeah, maybe we can discuss that uh, this after. Okay. Uh, Leila, you wanna add something? No. Okay. <sighs> right. So this is um, the data set um, we wanna work on, um, which is basically Kickstart data set. And um, it does have these, and these are some of the pre-processing we already saw, um, Justin that goes through last week. Um, and um, we divide the data set. We are trying to tokenize and um, take the maximum window size as we did last week. Um, and also trying to bake, brave, um, yeah. And yeah, so we get our data set, um, kick brave, um, I mean, kick train. So we get our data set after what we did uh, similar to last week. So um, we want to use LSTM to uh, make a prediction. Uh, so the most commonly common RNN extension is the LSTM network. And um, the Keras uh, API has uh, what is called layer LSTM. This is basically the same as what we saw last week um, with Justin did the presentation, uh, sigmoid using activation functions. And lastly, we can use the dense layer and we can use the embeddings first and uh, yeah, so this is basically uh, the LSTM, as you can see. They can see, it's a noted the number of parameters in this LSTM model, about twice as many as the dense neural network in chapter eight. It is easier to overfit an LSTM because um, we have a um, large number of parameters. So you see, the more number of parameters you have, the more you overfit the model, right? And so it is easier to overfit in the LSTM, so we need to, uh, actually come uh, with a better way to, as we see, uh, as we see uh, later that the model actually overfit in some ways. Uh, so this is um, actually, we need to compile uh, uh, a good optimizer is Adam and the loss function for classification as we saw uh, last week, uh, Adam and binary cross entropy. And uh, here we have our accuracy. Um, right. And also we can fit the model um, using the kick trend that we uh, prepare and uh, using 10 epoch and this is our validation and this is the batch size. And basically this is the results. So um, this is more or less um, the same what we saw last week, uh, the pipeline, uh, but you can see here the loss on the training is 0 0.26 and the loss on the validation set is this, right? And so this means that um, we are actually, um, doing uh, overfitting uh, because uh, the loss is lower on the training set. So we, what we can do, yeah, okay. This is basically also the, uh, as you can see here, the validation, uh, the loss, uh, the training, the loss is um, 0 0.2, which is uh, actually show that the, our model is overfitting. Um, yeah, also looking at the accuracy, you can see that. So one way to actually uh, solve the problem of overfitting using LSTM, or I think not only LSTM, but also, uh, I don't know if, um, yeah, we use what is called dropout. Um, so dropout is basically a, a very common powerful deep learning models that can be used to checkmate or solve the issue of um, um, uh, overfitting. So what we do basically in uh, over uh, in dropout is basically we include some dropout. We temporarily remove some unit together with their connection. So that's what we do in dropout. Uh, Where is my code? I think I. Um, oh, ma, 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 ma. I supposed to see the code where we do the dropout here. I don't know. Um, um, it, is it that code where there's there's a lot of uh, stuff removed? Um, I think Maybe this not. one is no. This is redundant. Okay, let's look at um. Okay, um. Let's go on. Okay, we'll see, uh, we'll see it, I think, um, next. So uh, this is evaluation. Uh, so 
here, as you can see, we can actually use, um, uh, uh, we, we, we use some carrot default for model evaluation in the previous section. So here we use um, a carrot default model. We just use the kick train and uh, do the evaluation itself. So we can actually, uh, but we can take more control if we want to only two, instead of using the validation split argument, we can use the validation data argument. So we can provide the uh, validation data argument also. So here we can have kick ball and uh, we have the validation split where we provide our kick starter train and uh, we do the split. And now here we can have our uh, kick analysis, which will be used for the analysis and we can have our uh, assessment, right? Here we can provide the assessment. Here we have kick assess and we have kick analysis. So this one is um, uh, having more control of what you provide to the model. And now we can uh, actually pull them out here, the analysis and the assessment, and now we can put them inside the model. So yeah, so here is where we put the dropout. Um, the dropout is we put the 0 0.4 and uh, the current dropout. So we can see here we have two dropout, right? Um, yeah, we have dropout. 0.4 and we have the current dropout still 0.4. Um, but here, as you can see here, we provide more control on how we divide our data and um, this we provide the validation data. Uh, so we can see that we provide them as a kind of a, a list. And now when we run this, actually the overbitance has been reduced uh, and the difference between the, our model performance on treatment and value is now smaller. So. Uh, Using the default uh, way in which the Keras model here I may actually may not be suboptimal in some sense. Uh, so you can actually divide, um, make your data the way you want. Uh, but here, I'm not sure why here they said, okay, drop out both in regular sense and in feed forward. So we know that um, LSTM or RNN, they have um, feed forward, feed back loops. So here the drop out will remove, uh, I think a layer and the recurrent drop out, I think, um, uh, we remove the feedback loop. We drop the feedback loop. So I think I, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but um, uh, I don't know if somebody can chime in. Uh, so yeah, because we know in the LSTM uh, when we have our layers, then we drop that is one, and the recurrent drop out is the the feedback loop. So we can drop some of the feedback loops to make the model less complex than to overfit. So that's um, I don't know. Um, just you know, uh, can you talk about uh, what you understand if you about these two things? Uh, I mean, just that forty percent. So that's the point four. So forty percent of at least with dropout, not recurrent yeah. dropout, but with mm -hmm. dropout. So for example, and in, in any given hidden layer, yeah, there's like a point four chance that a given node will just disappear on mm -hmm. each fitting cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess with recurrent dropout, like you said, it's probably point each backwards yep. mm -hmm. path also has a 0.4% chance of yeah. disappearing. So mm -hmm. yeah, and it just, it's a different, Okay. anyway. All right, yeah. okay. So basically we are just reducing the complexity of the model, right? Um, just trying to not overfit. So that's um, basically what dropout is. And yeah. Okay. Um, so I think um, here, as you can see, or oh, is it, did it uh, the same? Uh, let me see. Um, so does it make sense? Um, so validation laws. But still the training um, here is uh, most more, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So, um, oh. But from here is my program stop running or so I don't know why this um Keras predict um actually um I don't know um it's stop uh, from here my program uh uh I wasn't able to run it down uh, yeah 
Um, so um, I think um, uh, okay. So let me see what I can. Oh, it's going to be difficult to ex go through down the sessions, but uh, let me try to see what I can do. Uh, yeah, so let's go to a uh, recurrent neural network. So basically the top uh, here, uh, actually what uh, explained is just the LSTM and the basic idea is just um, to use drop out if your model is overfitting. Um, but let's look at um, the next thing, which is recurrent neural network. Um, so let's see this. Okay, so we can see this is RNN and uh, we have LSTM. So um, we can see the RNN basically has a single feed forward um, for each uh, layer, but we can see here the LSTM, uh, one of the issue with, uh, I think here, okay, yeah, here maybe, RNN have feed loops and hidden state that allow information to persist through the step, but do not have memory cells like LSTM. So we can see here, uh, this is LSTM, and in here, LSTM has a memory in which it can store. LSTM is actually a specific kind of recurrent neural network. A simple RNA can only connect very recent information and structure and sequence, but LSTM can la long range dependency and broader context. Because you can see here, uh, the, something at the beginning is connected to something at the end. But here in RNA, it's only one, only, um, uh, I mean, layer, each layer is connected, feedback, there is a feedback, but this one, they are much connected uh, to the next one and every other. So we can see RNN problem is that a difficulty with training RNN arises from the need to back propagate the error signal back through the time, which leads to gradient driven to zero, a situation which is called banishing gradient. So that is uh, basically uh, one of the issue of RNN because they are not connected because uh, you have something single and you have another one. So back propagating the loss will lead to the gradient leads to zero before it reached to the last one. This is the issue, it is called um, banishing gradient. Um, yeah, so um, Leila, this is what you are talking about. Um, You're asking, I don't know if you want to add something here. Yeah, so the... Um, I don't understand this picture. <laughs> you say what? I don't understand this picture. <laughs> okay, maybe um, I would have put in a better one. Uh, picture, maybe. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh my. Um. But uh. Okay. Oh, I have issue. Okay. Um, let me try to. Maybe we're not supposed to understand the picture because the guy in the picture is also confused by the picture. <laughs> so. Yeah, what's this? Let's see. Um, mm. I should have put a bit. Uh, yeah. So, so you were saying it's a it's a extension of an RNN. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. um, the layers, there is, sorry, I'm like reading the, I'm reading a, a different visual and there are one or more cyclical connections in there. Uh, so basically it's almost like it kind of seems almost like as if it's multiple <clears throat> rnns except they go through uh, hold on I'm trying to understand mm. um my <laughs> my mouse is ticking. I want to try to open a browser to show something, but <laughs> my mouse, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, so, um, so, oh God. Yeah, so as I said, um, this picture actually um, 
is somehow confusing as Justin said, the guy also in the picture is confusing. So this is RNN, as we can see. And um, one of the issue with RNN is that the if we stack RNN um, together, there is an issue that is called vanishing gradient because if we want to back propagate, mm -hmm. if we want to back propagate in RNN, then the gradient may lead to zero where then we have that issue of banning. But in the case of LSTM, uh, there is what is called memory in LSTM, where I think uh, I'm not quite sure what they are saying is that in LSTM, the memory, all the information is stored uh, there. So the gradient may not vanish because it has a memory. Hey. Mm. So that is what they are saying. So the, the difficulty with training RNN arises from the need to back propagate the error signal back through the time, which leads to gradient leads to zero. A situation called batching gradient. So I, I think I'm not explaining, it, uh, and the visual I put does not actually encourage it. Uh, yeah, but they do yeah. not have memory cell like LSTM. So um, it, I think the single the difference is that LSTM they have what is called memory cell. I think this picture does mm -hmm. not actually have that. Then the memory cell actually um, store those, um, uh, I think the loss on each layer so that when you back propagate, trying to calculate the gradient, um, there is an issue of uh, the vanishing gradient. Uh, Justin, can you add anything on this? Yeah, quite. No. Well, I think that there is, um... I think I, I was reading a little bit uh, mm -hmm. in an article and it seems like, yeah, so the RNN basically suffers from the vanishing gradient, problem of vanishing gradients, mm -hmm. which basically if you have, a, if you need to learn long data sequences, mm -hmm. uh, you are going to um, not be able to update the parameters because mm -hmm. the gradient gets smaller yes. and smaller. Yes, so the yes. It goes mm -hmm. away, right? So the um, when that happens, basically the parameter just becomes insignificant. Yeah. And nothing is really, no learning is really done. So yeah. there is like, um, I mean, there's a lot of math. This article has like a bunch of math that uh, <laughs> basically proves what happens. So it basically takes the derivative. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you have back propagation and uh, you you take into consideration time if the gradient and you update the model parameters and then you have a time uh, parameter and you um, take the gradient in respect to time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you just keep, and you find the back propagation. So you basically, it, they basically prove how when you have large sequence, the, um, expression, the gradient tends to vanish because um, the activation function, uh, the derivative of the activation function is zero. Is, is yeah, approaches. Approaches to zero, yeah. <clears throat> and approaches zero, exactly. So mm -hmm. the, um, but with LSTM, they, um, there is, the network has what's called gates that, mm -hmm update and control the cells and there is a input output and a forget um and they these gates use um sigmoid activation functions and hyperbolic tangent activation functions so basically the forget state forget gate controls what information in the cell to forget given new information that gets entered through the network and the input gate controls what new information is going to be encoded into this state and uh, given new input information. So I don't know if, I'm, if a lot of this is making sense or not, but it's it's basically explaining the process of LSTM. And once the information gets to the output gate, it basically controls what information um, encoded in the state sent to the network as input for the following time step the outer output vector. So these are um, 
when you have the prediction vector, it also gets propagated in LSTM for each time step. But the knowledge uh, encoded in each of these vectors um, also captures the long-term dependencies and relations and sequential data. Um, and so it just makes it more effective. Um, LSTM is basically more effective in that sense because uh, you can have sequences that uh, are hundreds or thousands uh -huh. um, uh -huh. <clears throat> of steps, um, which is nearly impossible to do with our basic RNN. Well, it's very difficult uh, because of that gradient descent problem. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but yeah, so LSCM basically the, the math of all of these, that there's a, like a bunch of proofs um, where they, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into because it needs to, <laughs> you <laughs> probably need a whole session for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so as you, we have seen now, um, so, um, the LSTM now is like, um, the solution to the problems of the RNN, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, here they are trying to uh, actually my code I think did <laughs> run um, yeah I'm trying to uh, compare the performance between RNN and LSTM yeah. to see what happened. So here is the same um, configuration we have previously, uh, but here you can see layer simple RNN right. Previously we use um, the uh, LSTM uh, here, just the changing of the layer, right? So you can see even in the RNN, we have the drop out, we have the drop out here as well. Um, but here is so the Maxwell plus one. I think this one, Justin, is, uh, as you said, um, we discussed last week, is the bias time, I think. Um, here we have the sigmoid layer, and uh, here we have uh, what we have previously. And now here we have uh, the, uh, we feed, um, yeah. So, uh, so actually, I, I, John listened to or watched our video and commented mm -hmm. in the channel that a lot of the times in our translations of things that were originally Python, you'll see plus one ah. because of Python's zero indexing. Ah, okay, okay, got it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So that. Because, yeah, I remember one of the things I said last week was that I didn't understand it because it wasn't in the Python code. And mm -hmm. so that's that's why it's in R code, but not Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the book should have explained this thing because this is not explained in the book, right? Yeah, that's we can add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It should be, have been explainable because uh, people will be confused what this plus one means. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the, uh, the, okay, let me see this, it may run, right? But it would, um, it's actually disappointing to see <laughs> without the result. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so basically the idea he wanted to uh, uh, convey here is that uh, 30, the RNN um, basically has um, a lower performance than LSTM. Um, as I said previously, that LSTM is um, a kind of, uh, was developed to solve the issue of RNN. And of course, the result will be um, better than uh, simple RNN. Simple RNN, like the ones in this section, can be challenged to train well and just cranking up the number of embedding dimension you need to other networks. Carousel EGL does not fix the problem. So if you try to, um, actually crank up the number of embedding and other parameters, it will not help. Um, RNN just don't work, work well to simple learning models. In fact, it can, uh, some machine learning model can beat um, RNN. So, so this means that RNN, they are, uh, are no longer used in real scenario. Um, it means as uh, somehow machine learning models always better pre-processing and like gradient boost may perform well better than the um, RNN, right? This Justin. Uh, what the 
Yes. I'm just going to say yes. Not, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, the next one is um, bidirectional ACM. Uh, sorry, my presentation today is actually reading, um, but uh, we can see uh, if I'm able to uh, finish. If not, um, maybe next week I can finish the remainder with the run code. So let's look at the next one, which is called bidirectional LSTM. So um, the uh, a simple flavor of uh, default LSTM also has some issue. So we know in text, so sequence modeling, as I we discussed, basically has some information from prior and the upper, right? Prior, uh, from the beginning and to the end. So uh, the RNA LSTM uh, information from, uh, uses information from the left context to make its prediction. Yeah, so RNNs and LSTM as a language models, they basically use the left information to make prediction. But in language, because I'm talking about the language here, the six structure move both directions. So for you to understand the context, you need to understand both the direction from the left and the right, all the two directions, you need to understand them. So bidirectional LSTM uh, is solve this problem. Uh, one left to right and the other one left, right to left. And at the end, you just concatenate these two. Then you have what is called bidirectional LSTM. So this is basically um, bidirectional LSTM. Oh, let me stop this guy. And this may be better for us to see. So this is bidirectional LSTM. So we can see here we have um, a single RNN. Um, here, which is LSTM. So we can see here we have the first one, we have this, we have this looking this way, and here we have another one uh, looking this way. Uh, what we can do is concatenate the output, right? So here you can see the output of this guy is here, the output of this guy is here, then you have your prediction here, Y1. So you can concatenate the output. So this is basically um, the bidirectional LSTM. A bidirectional LSTM allows the network to have both forward and backward information about the sequence at each step. And this uh, bidirectional LSTM uh, tried to solve the issue where we have uh, context and it can learn from both left and right. Um, here also we can see um, for us to use bidirectional LSTM, I'm sorry, uh, just use this, uh, the layer is named bidirectional. And we can use layer LSTM here. Uh, we wrap bidirectional, so layer LSTM was what we used before, but for if we are gonna use bidirectional, we just wrap it with uh, bidirectional here. And now the something here as before, everything looks the same. Um, yeah. So the bidirectional LSTM is more able to present, represent the data well, but with the same amount of dropout, we do see dramatic overfitting. Still there is more improvement over this. Oh. So, um, yeah, so bidirectional LTM, I think, uh, is basically uh, try to solve the problem of quantiles where you have only uh, the issue of LSTM and RNN, the um, works toward in the left to right, and bidirectional uh, solve the problem. I think this actually uh, is would gonna be helpful in language. Uh, I'm not sure in other uh, application the bidirectional LSTM. Uh, uh, will work uh, best more more so um lstm basically um uh well-known rnn in uh sequence modeling um yeah so i don't know if bidirectional lstm also works uh, the same in other stuff and also here this is the prediction of that um which we don't have oh, sorry about that um the next one is uh, stacking lstm um so uh, stacked RNN consists of multiple network where the output of one layer sub at the input of the to a sequence layer. So we can see here previously we uh, seen the uh, the what is called um, bidirectional. The next one here, which are all uh, variation of uh, RNN, RNN uh, yep. So this is called stack LSTM, yeah, stacking LSTM. So why do we stack them? So you can see stacking are generally outperform single layer network. One reason for this success seems to be that the network induced representation at different level of abstraction. So this is a simple reason why I stack RNN uh, because we know even like uh, uh, um, the 
uh, neural network, uh, the learning representation at different level, right? So maybe this uh, first RNN may learn some representations which are not that more complex, and the stacked one, the next one may learn another representation that this one cannot. So you can see that um, the representation can be learned a layered approach. And this is one interesting thing about uh, neural networks is that it is um, that differs from the uh, machine learning, uh, shallow learning, whereby it learns by layer uh, because one layer can learn uh, in sequence. And one of the things is that it layered learning, and but the layered line is also in sequence, right? It learns from which differ from traditional machine learning. For example, if you have a machine learning, you put them together, you stack them, they, they, you will not learn in that kind of format. So this also the same idea with uh, stacking uh, LSTM that um, actually uh, may prove to have better performance than uh, single SL LSTM. So the optimal number of stack RNN is specific to each application and to each training set. Um, yeah, so uh, that is uh, what uh, stack LSTM. Uh, what one, is this? Yep. One, yeah, I guess that's just an extra three. But um, what, so I admit, I didn't read the chapter. Uh, what? Um, oh, look at that! So beautiful. Um, What's the difference between a stacked recurrent neural network or a stacked LSTM and an LSTM or an RNN with just a lot of layers? What's the difference between? So at least in the image, the way that the image, uh, the last one we were looking at, the layers were called RNNs. So the layers were called recurrent neural networks. Whereas at least before, what we would have said was it's one neural network with many layers. Like we, does that difference make sense? Okay. So, so yeah, I'm pretty sure it's that image. Okay. Ah, uh, okay, this one, right? Yeah. Ah, it's not stuck. Um. Uh, I think. Um. Okay. Uh, what is stuck in LSTM layers, right? Um. So maybe it's just two different ways of speaking. And when people say stacked RNNs, they just mm. mean all right various so, hidden yeah. layers. So um, we know um, LSTM is RNN, right? Right. LSTM is RNN. What makes it different? Um, what makes um, LSTM different from RNN? It's just that kind of um, having... Um, the memory, right? So I'm not sure whether here is stack um, LSTM. Oh, I don't know. I <laughs> yeah, just just in catch us here. Um, I think I don't know. Is this stack LSTM or stack RNN? Because here we have stacking LSTM layers, but here what I'm putting is um, stacking RNN. Maybe I um, I got it wrong. Uh, is not here. Is they are stacking RNN? not stacking LSTM, I'm not sure. Because this is not part of the book. I just, um, uh, from uh, uh, another book, LN, um, Natural Language Processing, yeah, yeah. So that's a good question, Justin. Uh, I don't have answer for this, uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know uh, this, uh, I don't know. Can you explain if you have anything? I, I don't have anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Leila, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, um, <clears throat> I think that, um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, yeah, yeah. I don't really want to say anything. Okay. So I think, um, uh, maybe the picture I put here may be misleading, but generally the idea of stacked um, is just like um, uh, the issue of uh, what we know in neural network. Um, I mean, the layers are stuck, right? Um, layered. So when you stack these things, um, let's assume this is LSTM. Let's assume, let, let's forget this in the RNA is LSTM. So if we say stack LSTM, basically it's doing what um, is uh, uh, representation, learning representation, each layer, each um, 
uh, layer or each RNN it, uh, LSTM will learn representation and another one will learn different representation, just the way um, the neural networks learn different representation at each layer. So stacking this stuff will um, actually learn better than using a single um, one, yeah. So I think that's what the, the idea, the deep learning actually can be built up to create extre um, extremely complex network. RNN and OLSM layers can be stacked on top of each other all together with, uh, uh, okay. So you can see that RNN and LSTM, layers can be stuck on top of each other all together with other kind of layers. The idea of this stacking is to increase the ability of network to represent the data well. So yeah, so this is basically, I think the main idea to represent the data well, to, uh, yeah, I mean, to learn the data very well. Um, we When we have many layers uh, in uh, a deep neural network, the more deep layers you have in some cells, the more you learn the representation of your original data. So I guess this one also transfer the idea, the more um, uh, this stacking you have, the more um, LSTM or RNN you stack them, the better you have the uh, represent or learn your data um, better. Mm. So you can see, yep. Um. So it seems like you basically you can stack multiple LSTM mm -hmm. networks mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and basically makes it uh, deeper. So uh, you can basically uh, get new representations at exactly. um, higher level levels. Exactly. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can, um, I, sorry, they, um, <clears throat> uh, they, they, you basically are able to add um, multiple input observations over time uh, in different scales. Um, uh, so I think it just I, I think it just makes your architecture more stable. So essentially, like you would just have your input layer, then your next layer would be your LSTM network, mm -hmm. followed yes. by LSTM network, mm -hmm. followed by a dense network, and an output network. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it basically just I think reinforces it's like an ensemble um yeah so. just like ensemble in machine learning yeah mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah just like ensemble making it stronger that's basically I, I think the idea of the stack and the stacking also you can see here that um, you can stack rnn and lstm but i think it will be much make better sense to stack uh, lstm layers because they have those kind of issue of the memory area so lstm will be a, a better candidate of for stacking and you can see here, um, sorry, my code, <laughs> no, no code. Uh, you can see basically what you do for the stacking. It just, you can see layered LSTM, layered LSTM. That's just what you can do to stack them, right? So here we stack to LSTM and everything is the same as we saw previously. And now, yeah. Um, and you can see um, when we run this one, adding another separate layer, um, in the feed in the forward direction appears to have improved the network. So here I'm uh, concatenating these um, LSCM together, uh, actually improve the performance of the network. Um, Leila, you wanna say anything before we go on? No. Okay, All right. So, um, so pardon, uh, yeah, so different, pro processes that have a huge impact on deep learning. So this is what we discussed last week with Justin, uh, that we, what is called pre-padding, that's what is called post-padding. Um, but the default in text recipe, and uh, as well as most deep learning is pre-padding. That is um, before your stuff, you padded with zero, and we have what is called post-padding. Um, so uh, here they are trying to, uh, experiment with pre-padding and post-padding 
as we have seen last week. And here you can see the same data set um, we have for that blob and uh, we can actually use that. And uh, let me see. Um, oh, okay. Here, I think they use the default finding and uh, the same this process data. Uh, this is what you have. Okay, so here basically what they try to do is that uh, this is what the same model architecture with the default padding pre processing result in accuracy of this. So the default padding in pre processing is pre padding and it has accuracy of this and uh, AUC of this. Changes to post padding have resulted in a remarkable degrading predictive capacity. So what they try to see here uh, is that um, they try to use the notion we saw last week um, just to explain of pre pattern and post pattern and here we use a uh, change from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the uh, uh, I mean the default which is pre to post pattern um, and try to make your data create this uh, sequence one hot and uh, uh, train the model um, just the same normal not stack LSTM. This is basically the uh, single LSTM. And now it shows that the, the padding using post padding actually uh, result in less performance than the default pre padding. So um, we should be using um, uh, in some way, I think the post pre padding is better, uh, has a better performance. All right, um, we have uh, another case study uh, here, recreated model vocabulary size. So here is also um, another um, case study. Uh, before we saw that uh, we use the default, uh, we use a vocabulary size of 20,000 watt of token. And this is hyperparameter of the model I can be tuned. Uh, so what they said, okay, let's try to experiment with less um, watt, less than two, two, 20,000, and maybe let's use this, right, 1,000. So the same experiment is something, and now they try to do this, um, the same experiment using LSCM, everything, um, uh, doing the uh, prediction, but what is the result? Um, so the original LSM model with a large vocabulary had an accuracy of this and AUC of this. Reducing the model's capacity to capture a land text minimum by restricting its access to vocabulary, the result in a corresponding reduction in model performance, but a small one. So this is also basically um, trying to experiment with the vocabulary size. So the more, the larger the vocabulary size, the better the performance. But when you restrict the model to very uh, uh, small number of vocabulary size, then it may perform uh, uh, less, uh, less effective than the, yeah. So that is what they try to do that. Um, yeah, okay, um, the full game. I think uh, we are at the game, uh, the full game. Uh, so here, uh, they wanna train the model after what we learn, um, a lot of stuff. We learn that uh, default padding is beta, using large vocabulary is also beta. And uh, yeah, so they try to use um, everything uh, with the default that's beta to train the model. Uh, this is what we trained before. Um, now this is that, and now, while we find the models, we can do a lot of stuff that we have seen. Uh, we can use dropout to reduce overfitting, and also we can stack layers, as you can see. To actually, this is just like a, 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 a trying how we can actually um, do regularization, uh, putting stack layers improve the performance, and also the bidirectional is perform better than the regular LSTM. So it means. Um, even if you stack your layers, you can use um, the bidirectional because bidirectional is better than the regular LSTM. So this is what we are trying to do. We're trying to uh, use bidirectional, but also we are stacking them. You can see bidirectional, 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 bidirectional. So here we stack three bidirectional LSTM, and now we use the same stuff we saw before, the Adam binary cross entropy. And uh, yeah, we also use the same settings here. And now this looks promising, um, yeah, uh, because uh, the result what that it gives us here looks uh, promising. Uh, yeah, okay, so these are best performing models uh, in, the, on, in this last on LSTM model. So this is the best performing model, but they said that 
uh, this is not even uh, better than the previous chapter. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's what we have. We can visualize, sorry for today, we can visualize the, uh, the uh, model prediction using confusion matrix uh, from the book. And last but not the least, um, the self-attention, uh, which uh, is not represented in the book, but um, as I said, uh, uh, this one is better to look. Uh, uh, okay. So as I said previously, the issue with um, simple feed forward network is two ways, RNN and self and transformers. So we have now seen uh, how RNN is. Um, RNN has different kind of variant. We have um, different flavors, LSTM, uh, um, stack uh, LSTM. We have um, the bidirectional, and also we have what is called gated recurrent neural network, which is not presented, GRAU. Uh, which also uh, a, a different version of also the stuff. And the last one, uh, oh, oh, the last thing which also solved the issue with the simple feed forward is uh, transformers. And uh, if you are using uh, NLP as of today, not only NLP, but also in vision, now we have what is called vision transformers. Uh, the uh, state of the art. So yeah, while the addition of gate allow LSN to have more distant information than RNN, they don't completely solve the underlying problem. That is passing information through an extended series of recurrent connection leads to information loss and difficulty in training. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, moreover, the inherent sequential nature of RNN make it hard to uh, do computation in parallel. So this is basically the problem with the uh, RNN because they are sequence in sequence, then it makes it hard to do computation in parallel with RNN. And now transformer comes into pain and try to solve the problem of uh, RNN. Uh, yeah, so that's what I have, uh, Justin. Uh, um, I, mean, I cannot hear. I, yep. Yeah, I, I okay. also, um, I'm gonna head out. I have a meeting, but okay. yeah, yep. uh, okay. it's a lot of lot of a big chapter to ultimately in the end say it didn't work any better than a feed forward network. Yeah, yeah, kind of dis <laughs> disappointing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do they at the end of the chapter do they do they say why it doesn't work any better or on what data sets would it work better? Um. I don't have that on top of my head. I think uh, maybe I can check. Yeah. That would be good information to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, you are going for the meeting. Sorry for taking you more time. <laughs> um, we are over the time. Sorry about that. No, okay. Fine. So we see next week, right? Yeah, we'll probably want to confirm. Maybe mm -hmm. Leila wants to present. Oh, I, okay. I don't know. I'm signed up, but she might want to. So okay, we'll okay. I will reach out to her if she want to present. Then yeah. All right. All right. Well, have a good week. Okay. Thank Bye. you, Justin. Bye.